Nice to meet you, Don. My yes. name is Kete Homeku. I'm the head of programs of Third World Network Africa oh, in wonderful. Accra, Ghana. Can you yes. just elaborate some of your key conclusions of the paper that you've written for us? Well, uh, in terms of the conclusions, I've um, recommended that we look closely at the methodologies employed by the credit rating agencies and um, to a lesser extent the fund when it comes to assessing credit risk, sovereign risk, sovereignty risk. Um, I think it's important we do so because um, uh, there's a lot by way of the how they compute the scores along risk and uncertainty that is quite open to uh, bias and um, it's important because uh, that the course of pressure of the credit rating agencies and the fund has led to peculiar kind of budgetary governance where really attention is being placed to the needs on the needs of yes the needs of uh, investors and um, and financial needs more than uh, other important elements and factors or groups within society. I think we should begin to recognize the power of discourse. Okay. How certain kinds of privileged discourses become the common sense. Mm. So in our respective countries, our governments are being reported in you know, front page of broad sheets mm. uh, negatively if they don't um, uh, reduce their fiscal deficits, for example, if they don't uh, meet their debt obligations at the rate in which they should. And while these things are important, we should reflect a little bit more about who produces knowledge okay. about debt to GDP and when it's right. reached a tipping point, or who produces knowledge about the scores around how we see risk right. and uncertainty among these countries. We should really reflect a little bit more about that. So if I understand you, the power of the credit rating agencies has served to undermine the sovereignty of governments to make policy for their people. So you are asking for that sovereignty to be regained, right? Yes, yeah, so it's about policy space, uh, an enlarging policy space in such a way that it allows for um, other policies that move in the direction of um, growing these economies and industrial deepening and building a value added services strategy right. and pursuing issues related to equity and human dignity. Right. You don't do those things in, uh, in, within a budgetary governance relations where attention to credit scores, mm -hmm. attention to reducing your um, debt obligations, mm -hmm. debt service obligations, and attention to uh, matters that continue your fiscal policies mm -hmm. uh, take command. When these take command, then you find that governments are assessed by domestic populations and the international community on how well it can service its debt populations, right. how well it can satisfy um, the, the stress tests right. associated with these scores of the funds overview of these economies. And uh, because of that kind of misplaced focus, right. what you get is a development policy that's more about finance sector-led growth right. than it is about meaningful uh, economic development and diversification and equity-based um, sustainable development. So that's why you call in the presentation uh, finance becoming the masters instead of the servants. <laughs> <or the world. laughs> yeah. so if you take that idea further, so what kind of sort of proposal do you have to, to make sure that the economic development becomes the master rather than the servant in your recommendations, for instance? Well, first, when uh, I made the point that uh, finance is no longer servant of the economy, it's, it's not master. And it's precisely because of the rise of financial sector led growth models as the way forward one. And the confidence that we seem to have in this idea that we can calculate uncertainty and calculate risk. Mm. And that if you take the presumption that risk is perfectly calculable mm. and, uh, and, and so is uncertainty, then you are sort of elevating. Um, what really used to be a guessing game into some science, it's but it's not. So we're talking about at the global level, mm -hmm. at the local level, finance being in command. Right. And uh, of course, once finance is in command, it means uh, the role that the state should play, mm -hmm. and other private sector elites should play, and the international government agencies should play 
in meeting key elements of the Sustainable Development Goals is this place, right. notwithstanding the rhetoric. Okay. Now, just this relates actually to the whole idea that we should get finance to play a role in promoting equitable development. Mm-hmm. Takes us to some, and uh, your mention of methodology, you know, mm-hmm. of the graduate institutions, uh, takes you to one key element of this, what we are doing about heterodox and mm-hmm. feminist approaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, how does it connect in, the, in, your, in your own view? To well, that? heterodox and feminist approaches to look at this question of debt and development don't constitute part of the policy echo chamber mm-hmm. uh, that reverberates globally, right. locally in our societies, mm-hmm. as you know, and uh, globally at G20 talks and uh, wherever in these meet. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, the heterodox and, and uh, gender approaches point out one, the need for policy space. Right. They're very much against this idea that um, you're getting this coercive pressure mm-hmm. that limits states towards a finance sector-led growth route. Uh, They well recognize that historically and socially, uh, you don't overcome issues to do with rising poverty, issues to do with the immiseration of rural livelihoods, issues to do with sustainable development, unless you have a sort of a state private sector sort of uh, catalytic partnership that says, this is about the politics of the common good. This is not just strictly about making the place hospitable for um, investors and those interested in, in achieving greater and greater levels of profit. So uh, when Thomas Piketty wrote his work two, three years ago, yeah. 2013 I think it was, bemoaning rising income inequality, right. um, this is a little before we started to consider the MDGs and the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the response was that there's a need to perhaps put in place a global token tax or global tax on certain kinds of speculative investment. But that's not going to fix the problem. What's going to fix the problem is a a paradigm shift in the direction of saying, let us return once again to people-centered development that is sustainable, that's going to be promoting equity and justice. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Cheers.